Chapter 87, The Holy City Translator's Corner, Note, This Story is Fiction Forgotten Memories Part 1 It was a hot day in June but the two girls ignored the blistering heat. Their expression merry as they shopped for dresses and shoes. After all, one of them was looking forward to her wedding. Though the date had not been set yet, she was proposed to and accepted. Nay Chan, how's this one? Do you think Ajiro will like it? One asked the other, with upturned eyes. She could not have been called a stunning beauty, but was certainly above average. Aiko, seriously, Miguchi-san will love it no matter what you wear. Her twin sister, albeit older by a few minutes, replied. T.E., I guess. Oh, did I tell you? I'm heading off to party with him tonight. He said that you can come if you want, will you? No, I'm going back to the hospital. I told you about the patient in my care, right? The one with the stab wound? He was desperately trying to tell me something so I'm going to go check how he's doing. Eh? He was probably delusional from blood loss. What, did he call you his goddess or something? Geez, Iko. Even if you're marrying the hospital head son, you really should take your job seriously. Yoko admonished her sister. She loved to assume the older sister role, though she hardly fit the part. Yoko was a bright and cheerful person but she took her job seriously. And she deeply cared for her sister. Well, then. I'll let you know how the party went later tonight, then. Aiko said smiling. But she never returned. Dot. Dot. Saint Demon Confrontation Arc. 087. The Holy City. A city enveloped in a tranquil light. A holy city protected by a holy barrier. This was a high-level defense barrier developed through many years of arduous study. This barrier prevented uninvited outsiders from entry and protected the city for over a thousand years. It is truly the embodiment of the citizens' prayers. It can even block sunlight allowing the city's natural light to be regulated. It is thus brighter in the afternoon and darker at night. The temperature inside the barrier is mostly fixed throughout the year creating pleasantly cool summers and warm winters. And thanks to the isolated farmlands, they are able to harvest any season's crop throughout the year. A paradise where no one starves. Every child receives equal education and every citizen is employed. A paradise of law and harmony. Such is the holy city Ruberius of the Holy Empire Ruberian. Hanada walked down the path leading to the great holy chamber. The gentle warmth that enveloped her seemed to soothe her heavy heart. This country is wealthy. No one hungers or sleeps in the streets. Everyone is given a role that they respect. They wake up at the sound of the morning bell and fall asleep at sunset. Those with superior abilities help those with inferior ones. And this harmony ensures that the citizen's happy life continues. A land of equality under God. This reality called the Holy City unfolded before her. Hanata looked at the faces of nearby citizens. They all had a tranquil smile on their face. But, she couldn't help feel that something was wrong whenever she was in the city. She could transfer from the Grand Cathedral in the Holy City Ruberius to the Ingresa Kingdom's Western Saint Church in a split second. These two cities were connected via a grand magic circuit. Ingresa's capital was the most advanced city in the world and housed both the Council and the Freedom Association. Thus, in order to spread the Church's teachings there they prioritized the creation of a direct access into the city. In fact, Around 600 years ago in Grace a Kingdom and the Holy Empire Ruberian exchanged barrier magic for transfer magic and decided to connect their cities. As a result, rather than on this holy land, they gained the ability to establish the church's headquarters in the Ingresa Kingdom. Hanada, however, found the holy city to be the ideal and sought to create a society that would not need to fight with neither Ingresa Kingdom nor any other state. She sought a society where the weak was not devoured by the strong. However, in Grace a Kingdom and the Holy Empire Ruberian were was too incompatible. And that caused her to feel out of place. The free city in Grace and the harmonious city Ruberius, truly, 
they are polar opposites. And her discomfort only intensified when looking at children's faces. She could hear children's voices coming from the school built adjacent to the great holy chamber. Perhaps running late, a few children were desperately running towards the building. Those who could run faster were grasping the hands of those who were slow. A common scene that was hardly problematic. Yet Hinato found it uncomfortable. What would happen in Ingresa? There was a school next to the church. So she often saw children playing outside. What was it like? At the crack of dawn, the belated children ran out the gates with a smile. Those too slow would not be able to learn. At that time, those who were quick had a proud look as if they obtained what was naturally theirs. What do you think would have happened to these children who would help others like the kids of Rubirius? Certainly, none of them would make it to the lesson and be yelled by the teacher. Of course, they only had to wake up earlier. Yet this was a trivial difference. But for some reason Hinata's discomfort just wouldn't fade. What was different? Are those faster not kind? No, that's not it. Though they ignored the slower kids, they did not make fun of them. Moreover, the slow kids just sheepishly laughed. They were having fun even while getting yelled at by the instructor. In that case, what about here in Rubirius? The kids all have the same facial expression. A tranquil smile. The same one as worn by the adults' satisfaction. And somewhere within that expression was a sense of abandonment, hence the cause of Hinata's displeasure. She only started paying attention to this after the slime Rimuru mentioned his anger regarding the children. Though it must have been simple nonsense, Hinata unintentionally mulled over his words. Hinata shrugged off these thoughts. She couldn't possibly show such an unsightly appearance before the seven celestial sages. Last time, immediately after being told that Valdora was reborn, she received a report from the monster's country Tempest. As a result, though the sages had called for her, for some reason they weren't able to meet with her. Thus, a week has passed. That being said, that might have been the first time she had met them as the seven celestial sages. And noticed something she hardly cared about. Last time, when they were telling her about Valdora, was the first time she had seen them together. Previously, she would study under each one and move on to the next one immediately after finishing the training. And, after graduating as a disciple, she had never met them while receiving her orders. At most, no more than six had gathered at the same time. That's just how strange these people were. They've been probably running around the world for some unknown reason. If that's the case, then Veldora's rebirth is an unimaginably important event. Since Hinata had never personally endured Veldora's rampage she was not surprised at the news but could still judge its importance based on the response from the other nations. So she was probably right in delaying the trip to Tempest. But she couldn't just ignore a demon lord who was reigning so close to humans. And the presence of dangerous monsters only underlined the urgent need to subjugate them all. But, was this fellow Japanese who reincarnated as a monster truly a hindrance that needed to be removed? According to their creed, he was undoubtedly a wicked demon. So why does she feel so lost? Moreover, I see, I feel lost, huh? Hinata was self-reflecting. Feeling uncertain was unlike her. Thus mocking herself she hardened her heart. Right, even she could feel lost. She lived in order to create an equal world without struggle. A world where children abandoned by their parents could live happily. Perhaps that was an idealistic and impractical goal. But for Hinata, who was about to resign herself to this fact, the church appeared the embodiment of that ideal. Since then, Hinata would never doubt the church's creed and systematically work to propagate it. Unlike her mother who clung to religion, she was at a position where she protected the creed. And that was the source of Hinata's confidence. Though she didn't believe in God, she would recognize it as long as it was of use. Achieving one's goal was more important. Thus, she had never faltered since joining the Western Saint Church. And now, for the first time ever, a conflict arose between her thoughts and the Church's teachings. 
so she decided to seek advice from her instructors. Satisfied with this decision she found herself standing in front of the great holy chamber's doors. Without faltering, she opened the door and entered. Ahead sat her instructors the seven celestial sages. Dot. Upon passing through inner chamber she felt the air change. She was now inside the empire's absolute defense barrier. This area was isolated from the outside by a barrier that would prevent anyone not invited from entering. Hanata proceeded forward in confidence. The path led along the mountain towards Hina State. That's where she would meet her instructors. When Hanata arrived, four of them were already seated. Four among the seven celestial sages. I apologize for the delay. I am truly grateful for meeting with me in spite of your busy schedules. Hanata greeted them. She lifted her eyes to see the four calmly nodding. Their faces hidden behind a mask, she couldn't read their expressions. Relax. No need to sit so formally. Thanks for coming, Hanada. Are you here about Veldora countermeasures? What a dejected face. That dragon is a natural disaster, not something we humans can oppose. Is something worrying you? They asked. As always, she could not tell which one of them said what. Perhaps a single one said every one of those lines. That's how strange they are. Even the instructors said that it's pointless to fight Valdora. But does that not go against their creed? When she asked, they responded that dragon Valdora is a monster and is also not a monster. A dragon is actually a holy spirit and is thus a ball of energy. Therefore they were nearly intangible beings. And further, they added. That annoying dragon recently joined hands with a newborn demon lord. Right. That demon lord massacred Pharma's army. Never thought a single being was capable of such a feat. An evil dragon and a demon lord joined hands. If we don't proceed carefully, humanity will fall. Presently, they weren't in a state where they could offer resistance. But that was not something they could permit. They couldn't simply consent to an enemy's rampage just because they were strong. Hanada lifted her head and looked them in the eyes. And. Pardon this interruption, but I will not run away. Whether a dragon or a demon lord, I shall bring home victory. She declared. She couldn't forgive herself for thinking that just because the demon lord was a compatriot she could speak to him once. Perhaps they insisted that we couldn't handle them out of fear for the demon lord. Human hearts are weak. Judgment is often clouded by fear. Moreover, she found it ridiculous to permit a rampaging being to continue existing. They should immediately destroy him. Don't be conceited, Hanada. Normal attacks will not hurt that evil dragon. Even a hero could only seal him. Your attacks could hardly cause it much damage. Angering the opponent would lead to further problems. Do you still insist on trying to defeat him? But Hanata would not waver. If he needed to be defeated, then she would defeat him. I have come with a request today. She replied to their questions. Honestly, she had wanted to seek advice on how to treat her compatriot who was reborn as a monster, but listening to the report that he joined hands with Veldora and massacred Pharma's army caused her to reconsider. As she thought, humans and monsters cannot coexist. They need to be destroyed before they produce further casualties. Her heart free of worry, she felt at peace. And she continued quietly. I have come seeking permission to use the spiritual weapon. She quietly waited for their reply. The sage's movement stopped and the room was filled with silence. Suddenly, boisterous laughter filled the room. Fufufu. Fu ha 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 ha. Hanada did no move. She silently waited for their response. She's serious. Very well, we have witnessed your resolve. Perhaps you can defeat him. I'll permit it, this generation's hero Hanada. We will permit you to use the spiritual weapon. Spiritual weapon. That was a weapon reserved only for heroes and developed in secret by the church as an anti monster weapon. As an anti-monster weapon it could only be used by someone loved by the spirit say hero. 
Panada is loved by the holy spirits. But, having never sought this ultimate weapon she hadn't called herself a hero. Her abilities overwhelmed her enemies so much that she hardly had need for the spiritual weapons. But not this time. For Hinata, a hero was something that her original instructor Rizawa Shizu spoke of. A being which was both overwhelmingly strong and overwhelmingly kind. A being which could make people's wishes come true. Hinata understood. She, whose face were a cruel expression could not become an instrument to fulfill other humans' hopes. But this time she decided. She could not permit the existence of monsters. Perhaps she could not become the people's hero or grant their wishes. But she could become a sword that would destroy anyone that could do them harm. Even if that was a mistake, she could not allow monsters who would slaughter people without reason to continue existing. Thus, Hinata called herself a hero. And she drew a large sword. One that was larger than she was used to. It was so heavy that a grown man probably couldn't swing it around. Swinging it as a human would only harm oneself. Even a professional weightlifter would not be able to lift this sword. As someone who favored the rapier, Hinata's muscles were not overly developed. Hinata fought by beating her opponent's speed. No matter how specialized this weapon was for fighting monsters, it simply did not suit her. But, with no hesitation, she approached the sword and lifted it with one hand. With a carefree look on her face, she glanced over the sword. She could easily swing the tip at the speed of sound and wield the sword as if it was her own body. Her movements resembled a sword dance. No problems. But this was not due to her strength. Perhaps a giant could wield it with strength alone. Hinata was simply using weight manipulation and inertia manipulation at the same time. So this hefty weapon weighed absolutely nothing to her. And if she increased the weight the moment it made contact with her enemy, she could land a devastating blow. Furthermore, no matter how fast her opponent, as long as she nullified their inertia she could deflect their blow. Thanks to her flexible swordsmanship and these skills, Hinata boasted invincibility. The extra skills included in her unique skill usurper were perfectly managed by the unique skill a mathematician. That was her strength's secret. Not because of the spiritual weapon. The sword was the product of many years of the Celestial Sage's research on developing a weapon to counter Valdora. And Hinata has long ago acquired it. She did not need the sage's permission to wear it, she was herself rejecting it. She convinced herself to only use it when permitted by the sages. And they permitted it. Hinata released her limiter and returned to her true form. A thin membrane covered her body transforming into armor. That was the reason why she did not wear any. That is, she was always wearing it. That was the hallowed equipment, Saint Armor Holy Mail. It was woven from high-level spirit power and could only be worn by those who surpassed human powers. Thus transformed clad in holy mail, she had the appearance of a true hero. Clad in the strongest holy armor, with the strongest anti-monster weapon in hand, she set off. If you find any errors, broken links, non-standard content, etc., please let us know report chapter so we can fix it as soon as possible. Chapter 88 Towards the Second Encounter Translator's Corner A figure dressed in a white lab coat hovered over the defenseless girl. Though we call her defenseless, that would be because she was sleeping due to the drugs he had prescribed. His pupils dilated, his breath ragged, he looked as if he was holding himself back. Involuntarily, words escaped his lips. My beloved Iko, How much I want to hold you again! He reached out to her but stopped a centimeter short of her face. No, you are not Aiko. But you are her twin sister, so you must be the same, right? A twisted smile appeared on his face. I can hardly forget that night. If only she hadn't made that phone call we wouldn't need to. He sighed. What a waste. I went through the trouble of getting my idiot son to woo her and that's how things end, huh? Well, not a big deal. I am looking forward to our time together Aiko. He spun around, hands outstretched, a mad smile on his face. Let's have another party. 
I'll call the same guests. He bent and gently kissed her on the cheek. And left the room in a hurry. Dot. Dot. Saint Demon Confrontation Arc. 088. Towards the Second Encounter. Hanata left the inner mansion. When they confirmed that her presence disappeared, the four continued their conversation. What a pitiful child. She seriously thinks herself a hero? Yeah. She's far too inexperienced compared to the previous one. She wouldn't even reach the last one's feet. But it is true that she is the strongest we have. But was this fine? To send Hinata without the prince's permission? She'll be angry. But if we send Venus, Saturn, and Sun to comfort her, surely her displeasure won't last. Last time, all seven of us went and she still hadn't completely recovered. But Hinata cannot be compared to that person. They said, exchanging glances. Each one was confirming the other. We don't know what that bean is, but I'm glad it appeared. Indeed. Thanks to it, the princess has awakened. But we can't leave it as is. No matter the cost, we have to recover that person. They said nodding. What the seven celestial sages deemed important was the true hero. The current representative was far too inept. Though she was as much a replacement as gathering bits of salt from the table for want of a full salt shaker, she was nonetheless the strongest material they have come across for the past few years. But her heart was far too weak. Obtaining mental strength and soul that far surpasses that of normal humans. The weakness of her heart prevented her from achieving this. She's defective merchandise. And she doesn't even notice this herself. Also that her flesh has stopped growing. She stopped growing two years after joining the church. With her body frozen at the age of 17 due to the spirit's blessing, she can no longer age. Even though she is loved by the spirits to such an extent, she could never get over her trauma. Cool and logical. Trying to save the weak herself included. But where she lacks the most is emotion. She doesn't love people. Never being loved as a child has corrupted her heart. Receiving the love of the spirits had not awakened her. Regrettably, they could not expect a further awakening from her. So as long as she scouted the power of the new demon lord, that would be enough. Have we reached an understanding? Of course. If she wins great, if she loses. We'll declare that she acted on her own. Right, and then we will grandly declare our recognition of the monster country tempest. Hinata was a disposable pawn. Good if she won, disposed of if she lost. And they knew was how to avoid taking responsibility. All was done for their dearest wish. All was done for the, shrouded in darkness. And soon enough the sage's presence faded into darkness. I soon found out that Sakaguchi Hinata has set off towards my monster country tempest. She's bringing a hundred fully armed knight templar with her. Without doubt, she only chose the strongest knights who would not hinder her in the slightest. As expected of Hinata. She immediately noticed that half-baked soldiers would be completely worthless. But. I thought with regret. That action identifies us a naturally dangerous existence and rejects any chance for future reconciliation. Frankly, what is she aiming for in the future? If you don't seek to understand your opponent, your only option is to destroy them. But that would inevitably lead to a great war. Though modern Japanese knew how much blood has been shed in the name of God. In the end, Hinata and the church are moving by forcing their ideals onto others. Such actions completely disregard what the other party believes or has to say. I do not believe any justice can be found in these acts. Does Hinata not understand that? I did realize she was a person who disregards what others have to say. If the enemy is a monster, there's no need to listen. Does she believe that they would be able to display their true power when a war starts? Moreover. Just a thought. But I had been expecting her to act according to modern Japanese common sense, but doesn't she completely lack it? If she came over here when she was 15, does she not know the history of our world? Moreover, I don't know much about modern education, so how much do they teach these days? Well, 
whatever. At the end of the day, whether you can put your knowledge into practice depends on the person themselves. Not knowing something is hardly an excuse and one that doesn't matter to us at all. There's nothing we can do about the fact that she was given great power while still a child. Besides, she declared us her enemies. There's no point in saying anything anymore. I shake my head chasing these thoughts away. I have to crush my enemy. I gathered the department heads and went over the situation. First, Sai reported on Hinata's advance. On my decree, he had sent spies into the major cities of the Ingresa kingdom and Pharma's kingdom. Obtaining information is the basics of wars. When we sent an emissary to the church, I also sent spies all the way to the Holy Empire Rubarian. But, to my surprise, a squad of knights suddenly transferred and departed from Ingresa Kingdom's Western Saints Church headquarters. Since entering it was dangerous, further confirmation was obtained by the power of gold, so whether the information can be trusted or not. Seriously Sai. Though I taught him the basics of being a ninja, he developed it to suit his own tastes. Even I, who taught him, am surprised by how much it fits him. Well, in reality. The most important points were taught by Fuse. Though he probably taught him a bunch of devious things, so it's not like anyone could accomplish this much. I see, I thought satisfied. Sai sent out Suka and the other ninjas to various countries and is using natives to gather information. And among the information they acquired was the fact that there were strangely too many Knights Templar in the Ingresa Kingdom. What is strange about it is the speed at which people move to engrace a kingdom from the Holy Empire Rubarian. No matter how many roads they make or how safe they are, they move far too quickly. And, more people enter the church than leave. In the end, over the course of three days, a hundred Templars had set off. And the decisive evidence was the appearance of Imperial Guard Captain Sakaguchi Hinata. She's quite famous so information bureaus immediately found out. The hundred soldiers naturally saddled horses and departed towards the Pharma's kingdom. In other words, they are taking the fastest route towards our country. They'll be here within two weeks. With that mind, I should praise Sai for obtaining the information that quickly. He calmly presented his findings at this emergency department head meeting. He has become truly reliable. As expected, you've obtained crucial data within a short period of time. Keep up the good work in the future. No, at this point I still have many things to improve. When I praised him, Sai thus quietly accepted the praise. Truly, a shadow. His beautiful face is completely expressionless. Now then, using the acquired information we can come up with a plan. Though we have not been able to confirm that her party is in fact composed of Templars, I decided to proceed with that in mind. In that case, they are an army of 100 ranked individuals. Led by Hinata. Unlike the previous 15,000 army, the current one is overwhelmingly more hazardous. I am not planning on going out alone this time. Not planning on a suicide, you see. So what should we do? I asked the department heads for their opinion. How about we cut them all down? I won't say who said it, but let's just say that this person is an idiot. Completely ignoring whether we can or cannot do it, she only mentioned the outcome. That's why she wished for such a useless unique skill. Fight them all head on? If we do that, there will certainly be casualties. Yup. Benamar seems to have abandoned prideful thoughts. He seriously considers abilities and can accurately judge our fighting strength. Well, he often trains with Hikaru so this is the evidence of his growth. I always say that we should leave it to our general, but maybe that's actually a good idea. How about we use my Hariyu division to attack them from the sky? That might be a good idea, but they are Templars. Each must be a ranked at least. Even if we attack from above we won't be able to pierce through their barrier. We might be able to stop them that way, but surely Juryudo would do better at that. As you say. My division is numerous. And if we just need to stop them, they won't be able to harm us all that much. 
That's how the conversation proceeded. Casualties, huh? Just when everyone was safe and sound. I won't stand to see my friends die. But our enemy is Hanada, and she's dangerous. When we last fought I was able to run away my goal, but if we fought to the death I would have certainly died. Moreover, she didn't go all out. Presently, only I can oppose her. I can't imagine myself losing, but I don't know how things will go if the knights will fight along with her. Moreover, the knights pose a different problem. How should we treat them? Should we slaughter them all or let them go? They are humanity's guardians blessed by the spirits. I can't ignore the casualties created by monsters in this world. And protecting the villages and cities is the duty of these knights. They prevent further casualties. Most of them hate monsters. And these Templars are the embodiment of hopes, expectations, and prayers of every victim. Such are the Knights Templar. Maybe this time if I can talk to Hinata I can clarify the misunderstanding. But unfortunately, as we are monsters, she treats us as the plague in need of immediate cleansing. Not that I don't understand their point. Surely many of them lost friends, family, and lovers to monsters. And it is true that many mindless monsters pointlessly rampage. Monster Country Tempest prevents such casualties. And, we displace no monsters from these lands, it seems. But in some other land a monster may be killing a human right now. If we massacre all the knights, who would protect those lands? I can't just ignore my responsibility for those lost lives. How annoying. It's all because Hinata doesn't listen. That being said, there's no way to make them trust us or to avoid battle. Nor are they an opponent we can fight while holding back. They are anti-monster experts. If we underestimate them we will be killed. If we win with overwhelming strength maybe we could convince them of our good intentions. This sucks. Anyways, I want to win without producing a single casualty. In that case, a personal duel. If I defeat Hinata, the knight's will will break. What a pain. Without knowing her true strength I cannot expect things to go according to plan. All right, I decided. We will win without killing a single knight. But that's as long none of us fall in battle. Which is why. First, the yellow numbers led by Jiryuda will form a defensive line around Tempest. Do not permit a single knight to enter our city. Benamaru, leading the green numbers, crimson, and yellow numbers will be stationed inside. Support whichever section is engaged in combat. Listen up. Juryudo's group is our primary line of defense. If the enemy reaches it, annihilate them. Shin's Yamaguri. Gobble's Hero. And, Goblita and his goblin riders are our main force this time. Yamaguri will engage in battle directly. Even if they can't win, they are immortal so they will slow them down. Next, Goblita and the goblin riders will support Yamaguri. Engage in a hit and run tactic to disturb their movements. Don't allow them to trap you and so focus on mobility. Last, hurry will engage from the skies. Rescue the troubled riders and close any gaps in our defense line. And, engage with the intention of fighting a single one at a time. It would be good if the Templars can witness the whole battle. Sai will observe the battle from the shadows. The Ablo will avoid engaging directly and observe from the skies. If you see exceedingly strong knights, I'll leave them to you. Benamaru, I leave the final defense line to you. Juryudo, obey his instructions. Also, should the enemy prove far stronger than expected and our chances of victory next to none, Benamaru, immediately begin the retreat. Escape to High Ark settlements. If I fall, Veldora will face Hanada. That is all. I decided on what could hardly be called a strategy. In a one in a million chance that they invade our city, Benamaru's and Juyudo's will protect it. I made the plan while considering all of their propositions. I closed my eyes and ran a few battle simulations. Frankly, Wisdom King Raphael believes this to be the course of action that produces the fewest casualties. Actually, Raphael doesn't doubt my victory at all. 
this whole plan collapses if I have a hard time fighting her or lose. Is Raphael okay? I think this every time, but isn't Raphael an exceedingly confident individual? If anything, Raphael trusts me too deeply. Well, the Wisdom King trusts my strength. Which I don't trust hence our greatest difference. Ah, whatever. I look at the department heads hither assembled. They are all looking at me. And. In other words, we decapitate all of them, right? Dot. Just kidding. In other words, we're fighting without killing any of them and without losing a single one of us. In the meantime, Rimuru-sama will bring us their general's head. Seems like they got it. For a second there I wondered if they're all nailed in the head. But if Shin understood, then everyone else did too. I'll punch the sleeping Gabita later, so that'll also be fine. Now then, just so that everyone understands, I will say it again. If the enemy is stronger than I expected, if the battle goes poorly, escape. I leave that decision to Diablo and Benamaru. Also, don't forget to share information via the Thought Network. I hope we can all weather this storm safely. That is all. A, your will be done. They all consented. Now, we await battle. In order to assure my victory, I've set some devices up. These devices are nothing major. Me aside, the department heads will have a hard time if the enemy sets up a holy barrier. On a one in a million chance the knights erect the holy barrier, we will lose. These devices prevent the barrier from working. They were devised thanks to Raphael's analysis. The simplest such device would purify magical energy using spirits. But, you need a lot of spirit power for that. And spirits of right affinity are rare. Furthermore, you would need four such high level spirits. So, what is the alternative? In the first place, spirits naturally counter magical energy. And there's an easier way to achieve the desired results. Open up a hole in the barrier. To do that, create a large tunnel leading out of Tempest. Of course, the exit to the tunnel is located such that Benamaru can easily hit it while all he's got. So it's no problem even if they notice the tunnel. The entrance will be laid at a spot on the battlefield we deem most appropriate. Since the enemy is coming via Pharma's kingdom, we can easily predict their path. I don't want any casualties within the forest, so we'll fight them on an open plain. Other than that, I'm going to be liberal and reinforce the tunnel with demon steel. And that's when I thought of having Veldora guard the tunnels. And we'll have him release his usual aura when the battle starts. Thus we are prepared to counter the holy barrier. Everything is in order. Now, I am merely looking forwards towards the second encounter. If you find any errors, broken links, non-standard content, etc. Please let us know report chapter so we can fix it as soon as possible.